over the last few years, more companies have asked me to speak about leadership and culture. And I guess one of the questions might be, why is that, and why do people care about us? So I'll take you through that, and I'll take you through some thoughts that I share with other universities. I have the great opportunity to speak at universities. I'm speaking at Stanford Tuesday, and the longest running case study at Stanford is on NetApp. And they talk about how they have us in the ideal category. And the typical thing at Stanford is they keep you there until you crash and burn, and then they study why you crashed and burned. <laughs> and they're pissed off because we haven't crashed and burned. So that's just how it goes. So let me take you through our story. As it was mentioned, I got here. There are five people who have been in NetApp longer than me. There's 7,000 today. So it's been quite a story. But our first six years, we went from zero to a billion. We went from 250 million to a billion in two years, in 98 to 2000. And it was successful by any way you want to measure a business. It's the third best stock in the history of the NASDAQ during that time. It's the third fastest company ever hit the S&P 100, third fastest company ever hit the NASDAQ 100. So the only reason I, I bring that to you to set up an obvious situation that becomes bad in a minute, because 70% of our business was tech or internet in 2000, 2001. How did that feel in 2002, do you think? <laughs> Not so good. And so people used to ask me when all these good things were happening, what worried you? And the obvious question is, why weren't we growing the enterprise part faster? And let me explain what that means. Because it can mean many things, but business applications running SAP, running Oracle applications. Cisco's a big customer here in North Carolina, very big. And for many years, we had their entire engineering department. We still do. But we always thought companies like that would then put us on the business side if we demonstrated those capabilities. And obviously, it was not happening. And so we, you, instead of just assuming those things would happen, you've got to figure out what it is. So I remember sitting with the CIO of Goldman Sachs in Manhattan. And she said to me, you guys just don't get it. I said, what do you mean? She says, in an enterprise, if you have all the money you want and what you have works, you don't change it. So in big, big companies, they're not looking for the newest, coolest thing to move stuff around. The only time they look to change something is if they have a life-threatening event or a challenge that makes them do it. On the engineering side, like you have us in your engineering department here, you're constantly thinking of, what can I do better? For instance, a lot of our customers, tech or internet, what does that mean? Yahoo is our largest customer. Every bit of Yahoo mail in the world. A petabyte of storage is an awful lot of storage. It's 1,000 terabytes. A big, big bank, a major bank, Fidelity, would have three to four. Yahoo is 100 petabytes of NetApp. Every email in the world. iTunes. Every iTunes. All of Apple storage is NetApp. iMovies. I love those guys, by the way. <laughs> Download every day. <laughs> love those guys. A side story. I have lots of side stories. I, I had uh, lunch with the founders of Google right before they went public. And uh, they explained to me eloquently why they weren't going to buy our products, which was modestly interesting for about five minutes. <laughs> and, and they basically said, we make everything here. We don't buy anything from anybody. I'm, I swear, I, I, at one point I asked for a check, and I realized we hadn't ordered. And, <laughs> and so they did this for about 20 minutes. And I called the guy. I said, get done with this quick. Get done with this quick. And so finally, the check did come. Two founders of Google and me, they're going public in five days. And so I don't reach for the check. <laughs> I just sat there looking at it. And I forget which of them, Sergio Larry, looked at me and he says, is there a problem? I said, I'm just interested. Do you think I'm going to pick up that check? And he said, yeah. I mean, you invited me to lunch. I said, well, let's review. Let's recap. <laughs> you have eloquently Convince me you're never going to buy our storage. <laughs> By the way, they do about they do buy our storage today. But uh, and I said, and if the papers are correct, you're both worth four to five billion dollars next week. I'm not. <laughs> Why would I pick that check up? He said because every time we do anything, Yahoo has to buy your products. Oh, let me get that. That's <laughs> <laughs> how come they started that company. So. When we were a billion dollars, we realized, so the, what she was actually saying to me also, she said, two years ago, I had 15 problems. You're trying to solve the only one I saw, that is store stuff. So what? It's more expensive than what you do. So what? It's easier what you do. We're on to other problems. So we started to think about, OK, that's not a great situation. But if they do realize they have a problem sometime, for whatever, we didn't see the tech crash coming away to the extent it came. But if they do have a problem, are we set up to go get their business? And the answer was probably not. Why is that? 
Well, a couple things. Our sales force was set up to sell to technical people. And if we sit with your engineers and we talk about how our product works, they'll know if they can use it in a very tech-oriented way. That's not how banks think. That's not how insurance companies think. They want you to come in and say, here's, your, here's how you do this piece, and if you do it with us, here will be the financial and operational benefits. They don't want to know the hows. They want to know what. And so we needed a different sales force. About 25, about 25 to 30 percent of our sales force, we moved out prior to the, the challenge. The second thing that's really important in the enterprise is you must have relationships with the key application providers, Oracle, SAP, Microsoft, and now VMware. If you haven't heard of that company, a very, very hot company doing virtualization. So we started those relationships. I actually launched into that, and today they're incredibly strong relationships for our company. All of them use SAP and Oracle base their entire business on our stories today. So, 2002 comes, we hit a wall, just, you can imagine, 70%, plus, by the way, we had the highest P.E. ratio on the NASDAQ, 650. I remember a lady at Goldman Sachs said, that seems high to me. I said, what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> My job's sell this stuff. Anyway, well, when the crash came, 70% of you, so 700 million out of a billion was tech. We had anticipated it would go to 1.4 billion the next year. It went to 250. Should have gone out of business. Definitely, definitely life-threatening. But because of the other things we did, that two, the other part of the business, the 300, went to 450. It grew. Why is that? Because those same people who didn't have a problem, now had a problem. Those same people who had all the money, didn't have all the money. And so, here's some of the things we did that worked real, real well. Let me give you the punchline, and then we'll go back. So we went down to 800 million, went back to a billion, then grew from one to three billion in three years. Last quarter, we almost had our first billion dollar quarter, and we've been voted in the top 50 places in the work in America for the last six years in a row. 13 last year, six the year before. So if we had done that during the boom, it wouldn't have mattered, would it? Anybody could do it. At Google today, if they say we're gonna whip you between one and four every day, people go, no problem. <laughs> I mean, who cares, $500 stock? But. When a crash comes, you find out in business or in life if you have a friend when you have a problem, don't you? And one of the things you'll find out as you get older for the students, the people you think are gonna be there won't be in some cases, and people you never anticipated stepping up will. And those, your relationship fundamentally changes forever with all those people. And when we hit the wall in 2001, 2002 really, we found out. So our retention rate's been higher over the last five years than it was during the bust, during the boom, excuse me. I don't know of any other company that would tell you that. So let me tell you some of the decisions we made, and then I want to move into what our culture is about. And I want to be very, very clear that I'm not here to preach to you that we do it all right or that we have this figured out. That's not what I'm here to do. But I can tell you I do this all over the world all the time. I did it in Boston for a bunch of people the last three nights in a row in Israel about a month ago. I'll bet you've heard the things I'm going to say at some point but perhaps you're not doing them. I spoke at Oracle World this year. I was this keynote for their leadership conference, their top 400 customers, whatever it is. And right after, the guy came up to me and he said, Tom, I have to ask you, do you write personal notes to people? I said, yes, I do. As soon as I said it, I knew I was wrong. I actually send email a lot. But I, I actually thought in my mind, I did. And I, so sometimes you think you're doing stuff, but when you get reminded, you realize, you know, now I send a lot more personal notes. And his point was people keep them. It's different. You get so electronic, you forget that. But a reminder, that's all I'm going to try and do, and then maybe you can use it. So, the first decision we made, so we believe we have a disruptive technology. We believe, and we've demonstrated this, by the way, that you can manage far more storage with our stuff with less people than other people's stuff. And in fact, we can help you store a lot less information than everybody else through virtualization techniques that we've created. We can prove that. So if that's true, then in a downtime, you should invest. You should get aggressive. Because if you go back to my original statement, and it, by the way, we're about to do it now again. We just told Wall Street we're going to hire 450 salesmen into the recession. Because if I can do this, now those same people who didn't want to talk are going to talk. This is our time to gain share. We weren't in the top 10 in 2000. We're number four now. Everybody continues to grow at the same rate. We're number two in 18 months for all online open system storage. We're gaining share because what most people do wrong in a recession is they put their arms around their current business and try to hold on. The death of a thousand cuts. They never anticipate who they should cut, so they cut little, little, little. Everyone gets concerned, no one does anything. 
So what we did is we said, first of all, uh, one of our first all hands, are we going to have a layoff? And Dan Wormenhover, our CEO, has been to your school, said, we will never lose money, and we never have lost money. In other words, as I told people, well, here's the three areas we're going to focus on. If you're not focused on those, I would, if you like working here. And the reason for that is in hypergrowth, you invest in everything, don't you? Now we had to consolidate and think of what very clear we're going to do. So we took a step back and we said, what is it that people will invest in in a recession? What is it? Well, the first thing, you better save money. As Jeff Immelt once said to me, you either, the only reason to meet with anyone is they raise the bridge or they lower the water. <laughs> save me money or make me money. Why else are we talking? So first thing you want to do is you, people have lots of platforms. You want to consolidate those. So we said you need to consolidate those. So we worked on that. The second thing we said is, gee, storage, is, is, this is the only tech part of the talk, but you need to know a little bit about what we do to get the rest of it, I think. So data storage grows like crazy, right? Think about where you store stuff. It goes like crazy, thankfully. But uh, it grows at 60% a year, according to Gartner Group, across an enterprise. That's, that's industry specific. The least you'll hear anybody say is 30%. 60% is 10x every five years. Your information grows like that. And if I was going to look at the budgets of most companies to manage it, it's like that or like that. And the one thing I can certainly assure you is if you allow that to happen, there's no way that's true. No way. It's too much information. This will go up, and you're going to hit a wall. So the thing we said is, coming as again, we're going to go into the enterprise. What can we do to make that go down? Store less, which people wouldn't really think of a storage company coming in and saying, we can help you store less. So what, why do storage go up so much? The way storage works for most companies, exclusive of ours, all companies, is when someone asks for storage, if this gentleman said, I need, doesn't matter if you know tech at all, but 200 gigabytes, does, just assume it's 200 something rows. I'll give you 600 or I'll give you nothing. And the reason it's a fixed amount of space and what happens in a big company, you can't keep going back when you hit that limit and give you more. I have to take you down, go to tape, and resize it. Never happen. So they give you way more than you need. And typically, you over-anticipate your needs. So let's say I needed 200, but I only used 50. You now have 550 wasted, which you'll replicate over and over and over. So the average utilization, storage that stores something, is 30%. No one thinks they have more than that if they have any common sense and look at their stuff. Everything else is just replication. That's terrible. What besides a Jaguar would you buy that works 30% of the time that you spend a lot of money on? I mean, it's just not, not good math. So we said, so here's what we did. We, we came up with this thing called virtualization, and forget any of them. Everybody here thinks they have a certain amount of storage, but they're actually sharing a pool. And when the pool is 70% full, you hit a single command, you expand the pool. You can have a single command take back storage from somebody. Whoa. So Oracle, I mentioned, a very big company, huge amount of NetApp storage, the largest Linux farm in the world, 36,000 Linux stations, 10 petabytes of our storage, which is a lot. They have 80% utilization. That took that thing. <sighs> Without going any further into technology, we've done this with about three different areas in development and others that have allowed us to store far, far less to get utilization much higher. So that's very popular. Now, the second thing is, if once you bring this stuff all together and you have it on less platforms, what would your next problem be? If it fails, you better bring it back fast. And the way people have been trying to bring their data back over time is with tape. It's too slow. It's got to come off the disk. So this, uh, this is going to get into a culture discussion because part of our culture is we're a non-directive culture, meaning we don't tell you how to do it. We tell you what has to be done. And then we allow our engineers or our teams to go away and figure it out and come back and tell us how they think they could do it. A lot of companies don't operate that way. They tell people what to do. I don't think that's good. I think you want to set the direction, have them come back. So we said to our customers, here's what's wrong with replication. Go into disk. Every other vendor but us, you have to use the same, whatever you're storing the information on, you have to use the same thing for replication. So if it's a high-end system, you got to use high-end. If it's a medium, you use medium. That's basically all you got. Well, the problem is tape is way less expensive. You'd like to come back at disk speed, which is much faster, but it's too expensive. So we said to our engineers, there's a very low cost disk that's come out that you're using your PCs, ATA. Very low cost. Gee, if you could re replicate everything to cheap disk, 
You could change the whole Methodist thing. And, and so our engineers said, well, there's two problems with that. We said, what is that? The first problem is they break a lot. Anybody working on that? No. Oh, okay. They break a lot. That's staying the same. And number two, they're getting bigger every year, the drives. So each one takes longer to come back. So the whole idea is if you fail here, you can't have something wrong on this side. Like pretty simple. So we said to our engineers, make it so people don't care about that. Hmm. And so they wrote software, which changed a lot of the industry, which allows you to take, three, you have to have three disks fail at the same time before you take a disruption. Any two can fail. So if you have a failure here, three of them have to fail simultaneously here to stop this from working. The odds of that are almost non-existent. And we've exploded in replication. Four years ago, we had 7% share. Our leading competitor out of Boston had 39%. Now they're 31, we're 27. We'll pass them this year because people are doing much broader footprints moved over. And so now if I can condense more, store less, and replicate it faster, you've got a business. And that's why we've taken off in the enterprise big time. Because now, and into this recession, a lot more people are going to want to know how they do that, aren't they? Because they're not going to have the money they thought they had. I don't think anybody believes they will. So let's go to culture. So part of the thing, if I, all I said was true and our culture was not healthy and people quit when it got tough, we would never be where we are today. No way. So what is it that we do? So in the last two years, we've hired 3,000 people. We have 7,000 employees. That means one out of every three employees the last two years in their first year. So if they don't buy what I'm saying, about to say, our culture will change, won't it? They'll be our culture. So I travel between somewhere between two and 300,000 miles every year. And my one requirement, which we did today before I got here, is we will have an internal meeting. We did it in Boston. We will talk about our culture. We're going to stay on the same page. The most asked question of all our new hires, how are we going to keep the culture as we scale? And I said, well, first thing I would bring to your attention is we must be doing something right that you're asking that question. I'm kind of happy you care to. That's that question. A lot of companies with bad cultures, you don't hear that in new hire. And then number two, the only way I know how to do it, two things. One, you work at it by talking about it. I'm not the only one doing it. I don't even mean to imply that, but I, I'm pretty aggressive about it. And number two is the organization has to reject people who don't believe what I'm about to tell you. So there's six things in our culture I care about. There's six cornerstones to our culture. The first one by far the most important, it's the thing that separates people the most in the workplace is attitude, by far. So when we do new hire, which I just did on Monday of last week, every single employee comes through and all the execs talk about what we believe, and then I get up and tell them, if you don't wanna be here at the end of this week, if you're not excited, quit. Don't make us find you. <laughs> you will not offend us, walk in and quit. We'll put somebody in that chair who wants to be here, trust me. Nothing great has ever been done by people that didn't want to do it. Fact of the matter is, attitude's all about you care enough to sacrifice. You cannot possibly accomplish what we're trying to accomplish if people won't sacrifice for you. No way. It's all about attitude. Lou Holtz is a very good motivational speaker, tremendous actually, and he spoke at our sales kickoff, and he made a point about attitude which really struck me. He said, and he agrees, everybody I've ever talked to is in a high performance team knows attitude's number one, but he said, Ad, there's two things that separate people out in the workplace the most, in my opinion. Number one's attitude, and number two is your ability to convince others of your ideas. 90% of people are afraid of public speaking. Therefore, if you can just figure out how to help yourself there, you're going to pass them. We put a lot of people in Toastmasters, which I'm a big believer in. Learn how to speak. It's a big deal. So let's go back to attitude. What Lou said, the thing about attitude, you don't have to learn anything. It's 100% in your control. Have a good one. Every day when you wake up, you get to decide what my attitude's going to be. There are people who add energy to the room. There are people who suck energy out. They don't mean to look at you. But you <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. When you walk into a room, light it up. I got news for you. You're a new employee. You can't help with strategy. You can't help with the product. You better have a good attitude. <laughs> Need pizza? <laughs> That's a good question. Something like that. How about a Coke? So, attitude's number one. Number two is candor. I do a lot, I get asked to speak at a lot of executive staffs. We just did that for Iron Mountain when I was up north and State Street Bank. And 
And what I, what I talked about is if you don't have candor in your organization, it's your, your fault. Employees will have candor if the executives want candor. So it can't be a bottoms up thing. So we decided at the beginning of NetApp we were going to have candor. And so we, we ended every meeting. And by the way, do I think we have candor all over the company now? No, I don't, because we just hired 3,000 people. It probably came from places that wasn't accepted. So we work on it, we talk about it. But here's how we got it going, and we still do this in certain places. But at executive staff, we ask three questions at the end of every meeting. What did you think of the pace? What did you think of the content? What did you think of the candor? Very interesting how people react to that third question. Everybody does one of those, and well, I thought it was pretty good, pretty not. I remember the first one, I said, I didn't think it was good at all. Because I've heard people say something different out there than they just said in here. General Electric trains people to be CEOs as well as any company on earth. And one of their training things is they send them to companies they respect to see how they manage their business. We're one of the companies they come to visit every year. I was in an executive staff meeting, and the gentleman asked me to go outside after. It was about a four-hour meeting. He said, you know, for the first hour, I thought you guys hated each other. <laughs> and he said, after about four hours, he said, they must like you and trust each other a lot. Because they're typically, whoa, 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 where'd that come from? What are you talking about? As long as you're only thinking of the business and you're trying to help, let's talk about it here as our strategy. But when we go out there, we're not going to do that. The one unacceptable behavior, in my opinion, is to go outside and then say, what did you think of what Tom said? I'm not buying it. That's passive aggressive behavior. Because I think you bought in. You didn't bring it up now. So I tell people, if you'll challenge me, there's only one of two things that can happen. I'll convince you you should think differently, or you'll make me go away and think differently. Either one's fine. And if someone challenged you, other people are probably thinking that anyway. Let's talk about it. I was in Japan about two months ago. In Japan, it is not culturally accepted or not normal for you to challenge people publicly. For 45 minutes, they proved to me they didn't care about the Japanese culture. <laughs> what about this? What about that? And I thought, this is great. Our chairman's a guy named Don Valentine. Don's uh, one of the most famous venture capitalists ever. Don started venture capital in 1968 in Silicon Valley. His company's named Sequoia Capital. He funded Apple. He funded Oracle. He funded Yahoo. He funded Cisco. His chairman, he was chairman of the board, just stepped down. He funded NetApp. He's our chairman of the board. And he and his seven partners currently own 15% of Google. Did not sell it. Touchdown. Did not sell a single share at the IPO. You know, every once in a while you realize you're a stupid person. And what proved it to me was I was in Google very early in the Sequoia funds, and I sold before they did. That's stupid. They know more than I know. Anyway, I digress. We all have those stories, Don. But there is, it's interesting when you prove it to yourself. Don's point to me when we, we first started going international, I, I started in 1995. He said, Tom? And this is how he motivates people. You'll probably screw this up like everyone else I talk to. <laughs> but what most people do is they end up with a French NetApp and a Japanese NetApp using our company. You don't want that. You want NetApp in France, NetApp in Japan. They have to believe your core values, your core beliefs. They can localize for business. When you walk in their office, you should feel like NetApp. Well, our biggest facility besides NetApp Sunnyvale is right here. It's we had 200 people in North Carolina. Two years ago, I think we have 700 or 800 now. We've made the decision this will be our major expansion site in the world going forward. We love the culture here. It feels more like I walked in the first time and said, this is what NetApp, it felt like the day we started NetApp. It's fantastic. I love the work ethic, like the enthusiasm, does the things I want. The third point, so candor is important. When we hit the wall in 2001, we had a guy come forward and said, he's running a big group. We need to downsize my group. We have 25% of R&D in a particular program that we were running because we were betting on a business trend, which was distance learning. Recession hits, you're not going to fund distance learning. But he came forward and said, I believe I can do 8% of revenue. We should cut the investment to 8%, move it to different things. In many companies, you'd never do that. People tie their importance to how many people. Your importance should be tied to impact. What happened to him? We promoted him. Risk takings in our culture. You know what? People are funny. That, ah, IT people. We don't take a risk. You don't take a risk, you just took a risk. You don't make a decision, you just made a decision. If IBM did not go into global services in 1992, they wouldn't be IBM today. Many companies you could tell that about. 
The only question about risk, to, I, we can't grow. We've grown at 30% the last four years, year over year, on a $3 billion company now, going 22% now at $4 billion. You can't do that without risk. Because that's simple, everybody do it. So the only question about risk is what happens when you fail. What is the behavior of the organization and the executives when you fail? We needed to get a relationship with Microsoft back in about 2000, 2001. Steve Ballmer came to visit us. And he wasn't sure if we were a friend or foe. And he sat across from me and Dan Worman over and he said, the Royal Bank of Scotland had 88 exchange servers. One of the things they sell, and you consolidated to three, which means less licenses for him. And he said, why is that good for me? And I remember in my not so funny to, every, to, funny to everybody else but him, I said, we weren't trying to be good to you. We just, well, he's like, <laughs> Everybody else laughed, he didn't, so <laughs> it kept me out of the Microsoft meetings for a period of time. Seriously, we sent the team up there. We had a challenge, right? We cost him business. He's not, like, thinking this is a good idea. But over time, so the first team went in for a year. Wasn't so good. Pulled them out. Everybody there got placed in very good jobs because they did the most they could get with the opportunity in front of us and moved the ball forward. They attacked it with passion and integrity, and we held them up. People emulate the behavior you recognize. We held them up in front of the organization as a success. Everybody wanted to be on the Microsoft team after that. The second team moved it further. The third team knocked it out of the park. Today we're a global partner. Exchange is our number one app. We, ex we did a massive 1.2 million seat exchange deal for French Telecom last year. It's hugely successful for us. We never get there without those first two teams. And if we had treated them differently, nobody would have been on the team. That's the second point. The third point, if you get anything out of this talk for executives in the room, if you want to change, you want to pick up one thing tonight that you can do tomorrow that will help your company, I guarantee it. When people come to NetApp and when people are nice and say nice things, they always say, I love the attitude of your company. It's just a field you come. It's a positive field. Here's why that's true, in my opinion. We have a saying in NetApp, which when I came to NetApp, that there were two young geniuses who had founded it in their 20s, and it was mostly young engineers. And, they brought me in to do the culture of the company. And I had had the experience before of different groups had good culture, but the, behind it wasn't so good. And, and the fact of the matter, they didn't stand behind the people they had. And people typically would always talk about what was wrong with the other groups. In fact, I, I would love to have an experience where someone comes in and says, I just realized what our problem is. I am incompetent. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> I don't know what I do about it, but it would be awesome. <laughs> But I have had the feeling of that guy's incompetent or that group's incompetent. I have had these conversations in past, never my company, but you know I'm past. <laughs> so coming in the door, I said, I want to rather than talk about, sure, by the way, if you want to talk about something you don't think's right, make sure you come with what you think you should do. I'm happy if you have a solution to a problem. That's not the point here. Otherwise, you're just causing problems. But we have a saying in that app, which is catch someone doing something right. And if you see someone do something extraordinary to help a customer, to help someone in NetApp, you send me personally an email, and I will call them that day. All I want to know is what they did, tell me what the impact was, and give me their cell phone number. And 100% chance they'll get a call that day, regardless of where I am in the world. We have multiple NetApp people who walked up to me today and said, I just, you did this for me. I just spoke here a month ago, and I got bunches of people, and Scott said, who works for me here, he said, I had them all done before I hit the plane. I heard you did this. I want to know. I, by the way, I love it if it's a process thing, not just heroics, because you're also modeling behavior, right? At our sales kickoff a few years ago, we had 1,500 people in the room. And I said, how many of you have got a call from me thanking you or congratulating you in the last year? About 1,000 people stood up. I grew up in New York. I know 300 of them did not get a call. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I even looked at the guy, I know I didn't call that guy. <laughs> but even with the New York factor thrown in there, a lot of people got calls. And I said to him, what did you think when you got the call? Trust me. I, I called a, a secretary in Germany a few years ago because she stayed all night, and the guy said, you can't believe. I gave this talk in Pittsburgh. We have 100 PhDs in Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Before I hit the airport, call the receptionist. She lights this place up. How many people do you think she told us she got that call? And what I tell our leaders is, I can't see this stuff. This isn't like I go, who's doing good? They have to give it to me, and I'll be a, I'll, 
So my last point was, how many of you saw somebody do something and didn't find the time either write me or say something yourself? You're too busy. You're not that busy. You're not busier than I am. Thank people. I believe people leave companies not for money and not for title. They leave because they don't feel appreciated, nor do they feel they can make an impact. And if you can stop that, you should do anything in your power. Bill McDermott, he, if you ever want another speaker, I think it's tremendous. Bill McDermott, the best AP, is fabulous. One of the best executives in our industry. Good friend. And he said to me, how do you find time to do that? He read, there's a book called Contagious Success by Susan Anunzio, University of Chicago, and she wrote about this, and she interviewed me and all that. And I said, Bill, I make 10 to 15 calls a day. How much time do you think these calls take? How much time do you think we're actually on? It's about a minute. First of all, a lot of my calls are to tech support people. Denise is here. I call her team. They never think it's good news. <laughs> As Tom and Joe's, oh, you can just hear the air go out. And it's good news, because they're thinking some big customer just crashed, right? And I say, I heard you did this, this, and this, and I just want to thank you for doing it. It lasts about a minute. Then they'll usually talk to me. I leave invigorated, because they say, this is why I work at NetApp. I can't believe you're calling me, blah, blah, blah. Then I get 10 calls from their friends. You know what they often say to me? Yeah, I'm getting too much credit. I love that. And I say, well, who helped you? You mind if, would you mind sending me their names? And this chain starts. What can I do in 10 or 15 minutes a day that would have a bigger impact than that? And guess what? You don't need, it doesn't matter what your title. I'm talking an executive company. You don't do it by email. You I have a saying, which is people don't care what you know unless they know that you care. They just don't. You want to touch somebody, you want to lead them. And my fourth topic is leadership rather than management. I don't care about management. I, I assume people know how to manage. That's a mechanical skill. You manage things, you lead people. Leadership is an awesome skill. It was mentioned I spoke at the Marine Corps. I was speaking at Oracle World, and General Mattis, if you're a Marine, you know who that is. He's one of the most famous Marines ever. He's known as the fighting general. General Mattis asked me if I'd come to Quantico. And I said, what do you want me to speak about? He said, I want you to speak about leadership. Marine Corps. It's kind of interesting. Why would they need to be hearing about leadership? He said, because this is the group that's trying to supply the people, the, the Marines in Iraq, with the logistics. And the insurgents are innovating faster than we can react. Congress isn't paying the way they should. And we got real motivational issues, real big. Because all these guys have served there. Their friends are dying. They're not getting a lot of good news back. We need, and I said, then why don't you talk to him? Because he's a famous guy. And he just said, there's only so many times the same person could say the same thing. I just need someone from outside. And we talked about leadership. By the way, the end of my talk to them was you didn't join the Marine Corps for someone else to tell you if you're doing a good job. And those people will eventually thank you because they'll come home alive. You got to suck it up and do it now. You didn't join the Marine Corps to whine. <laughs> just, I don't know which way this was going, but I got more letters back that were positive. But leadership is about they have to understand the mission. You have to make sure they have what it what the tools to complete the mission. You have to clear away the clutter that gets in the way that can stop them, and you've got to lead from the front. Those are the four elements that you have to have. And let me tell you what every leader accomplishes. People sometimes say to me, that person is a leader. He looks like it. He acts like a leader, meaning a personality. I do not believe that leadership's a personality trait. If I took you around the world, and we talked to people in China, which I've done, talked to people in Israel, where I just was, their personalities are very different. I'll ask you to think of something just for a moment here. If you were to go home tonight and there was a message for you that said, I need your help, no questions asked. And it was something that wasn't easy for you to do. See, no questions asked is an interesting qualifier because without it, you do a lot of things for a lot of people. No questions asked, I need your help tonight. There is probably a very small list of people that you would do that for. Maybe a parent, could be a, a brother or sister, could be someone who's touched your life deeply that you've served with, worked with, but it's a small number. Now what is it, first of all, what is it that they've done that would make you say yes? One thing I would almost assure you of, it would be a two-way thing. Almost certainly. They, the one thing that they've done is they've done something that has affected you so viscerally at some moment that when they ask, you're honored they asked, and the only thing, the thought that comes across your mind is you do not want to let this person down. Leadership is about making people not want to let you down. They're not afraid of you. 
They're not intimidated by you. They just do not want to let you down. You know how you do that? You look for ways to help them. Be, you show them you care. You look for ways to help them be successful at the point of attack. How are you helping them succeed at their job? A walking spreadsheet is not a leader. Gee, you're not on your goal. Wow, really? I didn't, didn't know. That is not high value ed. These people know, uh, I was here about six months ago. I was in Singapore. I was just finishing up a uh, two-week tour that was pretty tough. I think I traveled about 70,000 miles on that particular leg. And I'm sitting in Singapore, and Denise's boss, Rusty, called me and said, I've never asked you to do anything for me, which I thought was a stretch. And, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. And he said, but we have some motivational issues. We were having some product stuff, and and we have a 724 here, and it's really a hard time. If you could come sometime, it would really help. That's all he wanted. So I look at my calendar, and I can be there in five months. Sounded didn't sound like the right answer. <laughs> and so the only way I could do it was to go the same day. So I flew to LA, 16 hours, 15 hours. Went home, saw my wife, dropped stuff off, got on a red eye, and I was here when the third shift was getting off. We have 724. And as Denise would tell you, I saw 400 people in the next day. It was one of the most exhilarating days of my life. When I got back on that plane, and the letters I got later, I knew if I ever asked them for help, they would do it. If it was in their power, they would do it. That's all you can ask. And you have to look for ways where you, in your job, can make them understand how much you care and what you would give. So when you ask back, they'll do it because they don't want to let you down. The fifth one, and this is one for especially for college students, I'd love to catch early because I changed my life in 1989 with this principle. And this is setting your own expectations high enough. Most people and most organizations stop themselves. When you think of the word greatness, you very rarely think of yourself. Yet, when you get, I've had some interesting experiences. I played a, a private round with Tiger Woods with Warren Buffett as the caddy. <laughs> Year 2001. They closed the course, got to know both of them, flew back to Omaha with Warren. Joe Montana is my golf partner. I'm a Notre Dame guy, so we, we're buddies. The only reason, they both have, all three of them have time-bound written goals. Different time frames, but how high do you think their goals are? They don't have a limit on themselves. I pick people, Michael Jordan, I don't know well, but that would be another person I would put in this category, and, and Warren is a business person. I read a study at Stanford, and when you go to these executive programs, they take you out of your job. That's a very odd thing when you're in this business world. You're always like this, right? Whatever you do for a living, you really don't think much about outside that. And so when you come out of your job, you start thinking about a lot of stuff. And what I, I read this study out from Yale, which said the vast majority of high-performance people have time-bound time written goals. Less than 10% of people have them. Hmm. Why would that be? One of the beautiful things about unwritten goals is you never miss them. <laughs> right? I think I'm doing pretty well. Cool. In fact, I thought back on my own life at that time, and I didn't have goals. And I basically was doing pretty well against goals that I hadn't set that couldn't measure anything. So I said to myself, what would be the downside of trying to drive my activity? And for, first of all, I said, why do you think I'm doing OK? Well, I react better than most people. Maybe that's untrue, but at least I think that's true. So in other words, I can let things slide to a pretty bad endpoint and then dive in and fix it. That's OK. So you have that either way, whether you're planning or not. So I said to myself, I'm going to figure out how I can try and drive my own activity. And so I do two things. I'm going to give you my system. Rob Salmon is our worldwide head of ops. He scaled uh, from our first salesman. Don Valentine said he scaled better than anybody's ever seen in Silicon Valley for sales. Rob showed me his time-bound goals from 1994. He's done it every quarter since. I'm going to share with you my system. Take it or leave it. But I can tell you if you do it, it's changed a lot of people's lives. So I'll give you, it changed my life. So the first thing I do is I set three, I'm going to set three per personal goals and then three professional goals. This is the essence. I start with personal. I do 90-day goals. And the reason is I started with six-month goals and did nothing for 90 days. <laughs> so very scientific. Again, I, want, I didn't want to give myself enough time where I could just let it lapse and then try and react at the end. 90 days, if I'm going to do it 90 days, I've got to do something 60, got to do something 30, got to do something tonight to get there. So why do I do personal first? It is my absolute opinion that if you feel good about yourself as a person, you will be better at business. 
People look at you different, you act different, you walk different when you feel good. So how do I set my personal goals? I ask a simple question. What are the three things that when I do them, I feel good about me? They're different for everybody in the room. You know what they are. Have you ever had this conversation? What makes you feel good about you? I feel good when I'm in shape. You working out? Nah, I don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I was the one saying that to my wife recently. And she said to me, that's just not a priority for you then. You know, yes it is. No, it's not. You just said it's not a priority. She's right. So, what are the three things you do? And now you're going to make them a priority. And you're going to get these things done in 90 days. So what could they be? They could be getting in shape. That's not a goal, by the way. Can't measure it. But it could be, let's say you're not working out at all. Three times a week on an elliptical, 30 minutes. I'll give you an example. It could be time with your family, specific time. Whatever makes you feel good about you. Put them away. Don't grind on it. By the way, I never show those to anybody, ever. And the reason is, if you show them to somebody, what you'll be doing is trying to prove to other people that you can make goals. That's not what we're talking about. We're going to prove to you you can break through a barrier that you don't even know you have. I just spent 45 minutes with Shimon Perez in Israel. I don't know if you know, he's the president of Israel, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, former prime minister. And his main point, he doesn't have an aide under th over 30. He said, we have to trust the young people. And he said, the number one thing I try to do with young people is take away all the they can'ts that everyone around them has told them their whole life. Because they can. We have to have the young people take more responsibility. So you have these on you now, I'm telling you. So the second thing I do, get away from that side and go to your professional. I set three professional goals and I only ask myself one question. What am I going to do to make an impact next 90 days? What is it? Three things I'm going to make an impact on. And then I share those with the people that I'm, are my internal customers. In NetApp, my internal customers are sales and marketing. And I say, here's the three things I'm going to do to make an impact. And you know what happens sometimes? I go, I love those two. I wouldn't do the third one. Really? No. We don't, either we don't need it. I wouldn't be that excited about it. The beautiful thing about that is I haven't expended any energy doing it. The worst thing that can happen to you is you expend an enormous amount of energy and then find out people didn't care. Trust me, almost everybody who's been in business has done it. <laughs> Ooh, I wouldn't have done that. Ooh. Well, so now I have six. And by the way, most people quit before they get to six. They say it's too hard. Too hard. You can't even tell me what you're going to do for 90 days. That means you're activity bound. You're definitely active. The question is, why don't you just aim it at something? It's only for 90 days. You can change them all in 90 days. People say to me, what happens if you change your mind within 90 days? Don't. That's the whole point. Accomplish something to give yourself a sense of accomplishment. Now, here's the two things I would ask you to do. Once you get them done, do not grind on it. Do not sit there and worry about it. There's no all right or all wrong. All you're doing is aiming. Put them away for one day. Pull it out the next day. Read them line by line, and after every line, ask yourself one question. If I do that, will I be proud of myself? And the reason that was so huge for me is I realized I was trying to make other people proud of me. And guess what? If their expectations are low, <laughs> God, given what you have to work with, I'm amazed you're doing that well. <laughs> wow! You should expect way more about you to drive yourself to a special point. Many other people may not think much of you. So you, it's again, you're getting pushed down. This is breaking out. Well, oftentimes, four of those I'll leave alone, but two of them I'll change. And I'll move them up. And, and I, would move, I would move them up a little bit. So another 30 minutes, maybe 32. And if you do that, that extra time, whatever you commit to, is what you'll remember because you just broke through. And then the second thing I do, and I didn't do this initially, I used to miss goals way, way more than I do now, is you got to take your calendar out and put them in and make these appointments with you. That's why it's a priority now. You know, some people say, I'm going to work out, just a simple example, and you show up at the office and everything's happening, and they say, can you help me? You know, that's more important than me working out. So you don't work out. If that appointment's in the book and you make it important, important, the first thing that strikes you, it's amazing that the world gets along without you. As you move up the food stack, one of the things you learn to do is delay doing stuff because it often gets fixed before you <laughs> have a chance to get to it. And if you're too accessible, they just hand it to you. This is great. You do it. I don't have to do it. So now I've got my six, and I'm done, and I'm going to do it. Two things I'll commit to you tonight that if you try this. First one is the moment the pen hits the paper, your life will change. The moment the pen hits the paper, you'll feel different because you are now committing. You're aiming. 
And the second thing is 90 days later, if you'll make your first set of six, you'll feel different about yourself. What was the, what was the filter? Well, that made me proud of myself. You can change them all after that, but you know what? You'll feel like I'm in control. It absolutely took me in a whole different inflection path in my career. And pe you know, one of the things about that struck me, if you were going to assess yourself, strengths and areas of improvement, so you don't put weaknesses, every, nobody wants weaknesses. And you look at areas of improvement. And if you think about what people would really say about you, what would they have said about you two years ago? How about five years ago or 10? especially if you change jobs. Would it change or would it be the same? And in many cases, it stays the same. And the thing is that happening is people look at you the way you present yourself. Therefore, you are niching yourself. So I realized back in that time period, people used to say to me, well, you're a great sales guy. And I used to think that was a great compliment until I realized they were saying, you're not a great business guy in their opinion. You're a sales guy. And a couple people got promoted above me that I was stunned at. Even, quite honestly, people around me were stunned because the person wasn't particularly talented, but they took on tasks that that particular leader <coughs> thought were important in a business leader. And I walked in irritated. I said, why would I not get that? Because you don't do this stuff. And then I realized I don't. I avoided it. And I stuck where I was comfortable and tried not to improve. So if you're going to look at your areas of improvement, it may be that they don't affect you at all, and you should leave them alone, but some of them may stop you from getting where you want to go, and you can address any of them. And I would put forth, to do it, you should have a plan. And you should, I want to end up here. I'm going to start changing the way people look at me. This is what I'm going to do in this 90 days to do it. And you can do it. I did it. The last one, and this came to me over the last two years, I've had the incredible honor over the last six years of becoming very, very good friends with Sydney Portier. Uh, I heard you say you have a great granddaughter. Sydney has a book coming out called Letters to My Great Granddaughter this month that uh, his granddaughters are in Atlanta. And uh, I met him six years ago, and all the people I've had the great fortune of getting to know well, I know him better than anybody. He's my best friend outside of work. Anybody who meets Sidney Poitier, a few young people, if you don't know him, Sidney Poitier won the Academy Award in 1962, the first black actor to win one. The next one was 2000, Halle Berry and Denzel Washington. 38 years separation. In Hollywood, he's an icon. He's lived his life with grace. He's lived his life with integrity. Everyone knows. I've, I've been with him where he's met all kinds of people, and they all are honored to meet him. That's just how it is. That's an interesting role model. And I started to wonder what he does. That, what is this? I really reflected upon him when I met Shimon Perez because he has the same characteristic as does Warren Buffett, which is as extraordinarily successful as these three people have been in three different fields. If you want to talk about their past, they can do it and will do it and they're eloquent about it. The energy comes when you talk about what's next. Sydney turned 81 three weeks ago, looks 65. That's, he's scary, he's aging so well. Looks, looks 20 years younger. So does Warren, Warren looks very good. So does Shimon. It's their energy about the future. Most old people do not act that way. Most old people do not want new things. They do not want to change anything. They'd like to keep the same friends. They'd like to go on the same vacation, don't they? My parents were unbelievable at this. My father passed away two years ago. We used to go to restaurants. Dad, what kind of restaurant do you want to go to? Let's try Italian, 100% of the time, 100%. <laughs> and then he would read the menu longer than everybody else. I don't know if you've ever had this experience with a parent where you're like, Dad, what are you going to have? He said, I think I'll try the veal parmesan 100% of the time. So one day I was so pissed off. I said, Dad, why do you read the menu? He said, you never know. <laughs> and, and you know, he believes that. <laughs> and the fact is, you did know. And it struck me as I was thinking about this, and I was so intrigued by these three guys. It's so interesting because they're so curious. They're always going that way. And then it hit me about businesses. And when I think of businesses that fail, they go like my dad. They don't want to do anything new. They don't want to change. They don't want to grow. They just want to put their arms around it and keep it. You're either getting better or you're getting worse, and both as a person as a business. And if you stay in the same, you're getting worse. So the simple question I ask at the end of every NetApp meeting, and I try to keep challenging myself, is what are you going to get better at? 
It is not interesting to talk about what you did before except to set up what you're going to do now. And as long as you drive yourself to continually get better, continually be curious, I think you'll be much more interesting to people. I think it's a much more healthy way, both individually and corporately, of growing. I'm going to end with this story about perspective. That happened to me about three years ago that I, I find motivational, and hopefully you will. We have a, uh, a thing in technology that when you meet a certain sales level, you get to go to a club. It's a, that's what they call it, a club. But basically, it's, you get to go to a nice place like Hawaii or something, and you go with a spou your spouse, and, and the company thanks you for what you did, basically. And it's not just technology. It's in other companies, too. But in our company, we focus on the spouse when they come because it's about sacrifice. Someone's given up for you not to be home to make this all happen. We also invite 10 to 15 people who are not in that sales or systems guys from all over the company. Now, out of, in our case, out of 5,500 employees, 10 or 15 are going to get selected. How big an honor is that? It's huge. And they're getting put, they're going to be held up in front of their spouse or whoever they're, and they're going to be told that you were selected over all these people by your peers. That's an enormous honor. Well. If your spouse can't go, you can bring whoever you want. Or you, you know, sometimes they have babies and whatever. Every year, 10 to 15 of this group of the whole thing bring their parent, which I think is awesome. And my only requirement is I meet the parent as fast as possible. And they get there because they're always a little feeling a little odd because, you know, they're not sure it's going to work. But as soon as I tell them that we're happy to have them and I'm buying all their drinks, it somehow goes away. <laughs> they're not, like, uptight the second day ever, ever. So we were in the Bahamas three years ago, and I got nine out of ten done, and I am a goal-driven person, as you kind of told you tonight. So I had one more to go, and it was Mrs. Berkovici. Val Berkovici works for us in Canada. He runs our competitive information. Spectacular guy. Available to our sales force at all hours. Built to just a great guy. Very, very well respected. And his mother had come with him, and I couldn't find her anyway. So I finished this talk, and I just finished talking about those 15 guests. Recognized in front of the whole group. And then we go out to the pool to have this nice reception, and somebody says to me, there's Mrs. Berkovici. And I'm like, oh, 10 out of 10. <laughs> and I go walking up, and I get like 10 feet away, and I realize she's sobbing. Sobbing. I tried to do my Michael Jackson. <laughs> I tried to get out of there. And she turns around, and she, and she even knows my name. So I'm, I'm like dead no matter how to, I just talked, right? So I got to talk to her. So I said, well, Mrs. Berkovich, I said, I'm really sorry for whatever happened. Uh, you know, I've tried hard to fix it. And she talked to me. I couldn't quite understand because she was choked up, and, and she had a very heavy Russian accent. And she looked at me, and she said, I escaped from Russia. And then she told me about the job she took when she escaped from Russia and how she got to Canada. And she said, I only have one son, and that's it. So this is the happiest moment of my life. She had just seen her son recognized. And so right after that, I had to speak to our sales team, 1,500 people in Chicago. And I said, I'll bet if I went back, and I'm telling this to you tonight, I'll bet if I went back in your families, no more than one or two generations, you have a Mrs. Berkovici in your family. Somebody, their only goal is to give somebody in their family someday this kind of shot. Can I ask you to think of two things we have a private moment. If that person was standing there right now behind you all, how proud would they be of what you've accomplished and what the opportunity, if you're a student, you're at a wonderful university with your life in front of you, you wouldn't have had this opportunity without them. If you're in business, the success you've had, how proud would they be? And number two, what would they have given to sit in your seat? What would they have given to that? And all I tell our own people is, you know, if you don't want to work for our company, that is no harm, no foul. You go do whatever you want. If you're going to work for our company, we're going to make sure we honor the fact that people have given us this opportunity, both within our families and within the family and NetApp, to go forward and do the best we can. That's all we can do. And I think that's just a spectacular opportunity for all of us. And we should feel that, that obligation to do the best we can. That's all it takes. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Do you want me to take questions? I know it's late, and if you don't want to hang around, I'm not offended. Scott, what time do I have to be at Piners? 
If you'd like to ask any questions about anything, I'd be happy to uh, maybe we just do a few and whatever you'd like to do. I don't want to hold you up, but if anybody has anything they'd like to ask, I'm happy to answer. Clearly not a sales group. <laughs> I have a question. Okay. Um, have you ever uh, thought about writing a book with all of your ideas? Uh, the question is, have I ever thought about writing a book? Uh, yeah, but I don't think I'll. <laughs> no, but I, I would never do it while I'm working at NetApp because it's just still happening, you know what I'm saying? Um, my passion would be not to, I don't care about making money doing it, but I would love to figure out a way, maybe like podcasting or something like that. That I, if, if my advice could help anybody at some moment, that later on they look back and they're happy they heard it, and I think I'm better, better speaking than I am writing. So I probably, at some point I would try and relate what I'm doing on to a broader audience, and if I could do that in a way that people would like it, I'd do it. You know, I get asked to do this. I've done this for various groups now, and uh, they put it on the web and things like that. But I, I simply just don't know. If, you know, I, I do speak for a lot of, I like speaking to universities because I just feel if you can give back to education, that's the best gift you can give. If you can, somebody asked me back in 1977, I got interviewed for a magazine a long time ago, just starting in leadership. What's your long-term goals? In 1977, my long-term goal was what's for dinner, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> was that, but long-term planning. But what I did say is sometime, many years in the future, and to me that was like 10 years, <laughs> you know, in your 20s. No, I, I was saying sometime 20 years from now, on people or whatever, and they're looking back on people that have helped them in their life. I just, I live my life, and when I get to speak, thinking that maybe I say something or do something just the moment they need it. And I'm one of the people they reflect upon. That's it. I don't really, I don't care if they tell me. Let me give you some thoughts on public speaking since I do a lot of it. And I told you it's important. So I never think about, I, you notice I don't use slides. I don't use slides when I speak at Oracle World or any of that. And it always surprises people because they're so used to it. There's a reason for that. Before I speak to an audience, I think what I want them to think, what I want them to feel, most importantly, and then what I want them to do. What I want, if, if it was an action oriented, but feel is the important one. People do not feel data. There's nothing about data you feel. So the art of speaking, if you want to keep it at the highest level possible, is about telling stories. And what is the structure of a story? This happened, so that happened, so that happened. You think of anybody you'd like to listen to speak, you listen because you want to know the end of the story. A lot of people get up with no story. They just give you data. And so you just don't care. You don't feel anything. So if you're going to think of, I don't care what your subject is, my advice to public speakers is know exactly how you're going to start. Exactly. First 10 words, because now you're off smoothly. How are you going to finish? And what are the three main points that you want to drive? And I have my three points. If I'm doing a big talk like to our sales team, I'll have pages and pages and pages, potentially, of research on all three points. And then I keep asking myself, what, but what, is my, what is the story of that point? What's the story of that point? And what's the story of that point? Until I get it down to this is what they got to get out of it. So I'll have the beginning, three points, and then, and then I throw it away. I'm only here to, I only have to remember three things. It doesn't matter how I get there. You don't care how I get there. You just want to know what the story is. And so many people so focus on the data, they don't tell a story. So, you know, I think I, I, I like talking to people because I like the interaction part of it more than sitting back and writing a book at this point in my life. What's the uh, one biggest success in your life that you would share if you come up with another one? Ooh, and I actually know the answer to that, which is scary. What's the biggest success in my life that I'm proud of, and there's no doubt about it, it's the endowment of the business school at Notre Dame and watching my father see his name go up? I'll share this story with you, and it's, uh, it's unbelievable. So, so my mom passed away in uh, 1994, and NetApp was just starting to be successful. And I called Notre Dame, and, and you university people should really appreciate it. This is an incoming call. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't happen that much, I'm, uh, my exp what I'm hearing. And I called them, and I said, I would like to, because I was afraid about my dad. You know, you have this thing where they're married 50 years, and you know, a lot of times when one goes, the other one. So I said, I'd like to endow a four-year scholarship forever in my father's name. You know, you give a, a, a sum of money, and they, live, they do it after you, whatever. 
And I said, but I got three conditions, which is not what they want to hear in that particular conversation. <laughs> like, you got to take my kid. That would, like, kill that whole thing. <laughs> but they're good enough salespeople not to go, no. Nope. So they said, well, what do you have in mind? I said, the first condition, I don't care if it's black, white, what race, what age, what sex. But it's got to be their passion to go to Notre Dame. It's not, this isn't about Notre Dame. It happened to be my school. Whatever you're passionate about. But it's not like this kid's going to consider it. There's so many kids that I know from letters I get that their dream is that particular school. They're going to have everything you want but money, and you're going to give them that. You're going to tell them their four-year rides paid for by my father. What's number two? <laughs> number two, they're going to write my father a letter every semester. I said, it's, he's a letter writer. I want him to be able to physically. My father passed away two years ago. He had a stack of letters that big. Those kids wrote to him right to the day he died. And they said, what's number three? Going good so far. I said, number three is you've got to write my father the best letter he's ever gotten in his life. My father calls me up and, Tom, I've been invited to a football game for Notre Dame. I said, Dad, Notre Dame is a cathedral in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> we have never made it through that knot hole in all these years. <laughs> I digress again. Anyway, we had to go buy him a jacket because he, he had retired. And all. He said, how do you think they found me? I said, you're a pretty important guy, Dad. He said, oh, yeah. So he goes to the event, and Monk Malloy, Father Malloy, wrote the father, president of the university, wrote, read this letter. And the end is, as long as there's a University of Notre Dame, there'll be an Arthur A. Mendoza scholar. You fast forward five years, our stock has gone crazy. And my wife and I talked, and I said, I'd like to do something big for Notre Dame. And we've also done something big for Oklahoma. That's where she went to school. The president of Oklahoma, when he read about our endowment, sends her a letter. He said, I'm looking at a large stack of Tulsa Worlds, which is that paper, saying, why don't you call this woman? <laughs> that was a classy way of doing it. Anyway, so I called Notre Dame, incoming number two. And I said, I'd like to do something that might change the inflection of the school. And they said, well, in no uncertain term, you know, in a salesy way, how much do you want to spend? And I basically said, I would focus much more on the what than the how much, because I'm not going to do it if I'm not interested. And they came out and spoke to me, and, and they brought up the business school that struck a chord with me. There were no named schools at Notre Dame. Uh, and they, it just struck a chord because it's something I know something about as opposed to some of the other things they brought up. Anyway, we did it. And uh, so my father comes to this event. My mom had passed. My father-in-law had just passed, and I love my father-in-law. We started the day on Friday. This is the, it was the largest endowment in the history of Notre Dame. So we start today, they wanted to do a black tie mass. I'm not Catholic. <laughs> Catholics have this thing about getting up, sitting down all the time. So the dean of the business school had my shirt like this. I still, I, I don't know. But anyway, it's interesting. We're going to do a black tie mass. I, the other Catholics were more impressed than me. I thought maybe they did it every Friday or something, every Saturday. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway. So we start the day with the six kids at that time in my father's, who have scholarships in my father's name. And as we're walking to meet these kids, he has a panic attack, a real serious panic attack. And he says, I can't do this. I said, what do you mean you can't do it? It's Friday morning. And he said, because uh, the mess the was on Friday night. That's why I, I said Friday. And he said, uh, they're going to want to see you, because there were posters up everywhere and everything. And uh, I said, I don't, I don't know. If that's true, we'll leave right away, but let's try it. They walk right by me. They all had scrapbooks from World War II from their fathers. Hour and a half later, I said, Dad, we got to go. Said, no, go ahead. <laughs> I'm good. So I end up leaving them there. I then spoke at the football lunch, and they had me address the football team on the field the week before. That, that particular year, we were overcoming a bad season. We went 10-2, and two, but they had me address the team on the field the week before. And they asked me to review that again in front of 10,000 people or whatever was at that luncheon. My dad watched that. It's the only time he ever saw me speak. So the athletic director, I've thrown out the most bad moment. The athletic director <laughs> says to me, I, you know, I like watching you speak, but I never heard a word because I was watching your dad, and I was thinking that that was my dad. We then went over to the business school, which was packed. In fact, Warren Buffett was in the last row. I didn't know that till later. So I've heard you speak before. We played in Nebraska the next day. So he was in the last row. But this thing was packed. If it, it seats uh, 250, and every aisle had people, there was nowhere when you could look out there wasn't a person. And they were a happy crowd, all kinds of people, students. And I come in late because I'm speaking to football. Right? My wife did a David Letterman top 10 reasons we're happy we gave the gift. One, I hope we quit getting letters about Tom's parking tickets, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's call out a wash at this point, OK? 
And I get up and I said, if three things happen to you in your life, you should consider yourself fortunate. Number one is if you live in a country where this could happen to you. Both sets of parents, sixth grade education, many parts of the world, the end of the script would have been written regardless of your supposed talent or intensity. This country allowed me to, to get where I'm at. Number two, that's why I use the word fortunate rather than lucky. Fortunate, I feel like you have to give back. Number two is if you have parents who tell you you can. I don't think it's about money, but I never overcame negative abuse. I've had friends I found later that always told me I can't, you know, the thing I said before, I didn't have that. And number three, if you have a marriage, I've been married 27 years. I don't have kids, so I'm married because I want to be, which is kind of <laughs> interesting. Uh, I've been married, with all my travel, I've been married 27 together six. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Every time my wife gets irritated, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> you know? uh, but it, if you have a marriage where your wife's happiness means more to you than your own, and she feels the same way, and young people, I'm not trying to tell you to get married young, because I did not. But there's a strength and a belief when someone's on your side every day that's hard to describe if you haven't experienced because it's tough to do it all on your own and I had it. And then I said, if you could imagine if your parent could see their name go up in this, and I said, I'd like to bring my dad up. And that audience and many of them, Jack Welsh was in the front row, Larry Bossidy, they all cried. Everyone cried. They were pounding and crying for 10 minutes and that's a long time to stand up. And to know that my dad was feeling that was unbelievable. And then the final moment, we begin, so then we do this black tie mask, the up-down thing. They did a ceremony outside. All this was good. But the next day, we went to mass with the team. What they do at Notre Dame, the team goes to mass. The doors fly open. You walk through thousands and thousands of people to the stadium. And then we went right into the locker room. Down, and then my father walked the flag out for the national anthem in front of 80,000 people. And they announced the gift. And there's a picture on my wall of my father snapping into a salute with the flag half the way up. That's the moment. I'll never forget that as long as I live.